Hello, this is George Hutton, and you are listening to the Mind Persuasion Podcast. Today, we continue our study of money brain. For more information, please visit mindpersuasion.com forward slash money dash brain. And today's podcast will be exploring various types of money and how they are used in various different types of societies. Imagine you were a corn farmer or a shoemaker or a roof fixer way back in some ancient society. And imagine they used a certain kind of seashell as commodity money. Well, imagine this society was near the ocean. And you worked hard for several years and had saved up a big sack of seashells. So a few years had passed, and you decided to grab a handful of seashells, head into town, and have some fun. Only everywhere you went, you found that nobody was taking seashells anymore. All this work, and now you're broke. In this podcast, we'll discuss the various types of commodity money, how they might come in and out of favor, and how a couple of very common things have always been preferred as money. While it's not much of a big deal today since we all use the same basic money, it's important to understand how money is created, how it's used, and how it may die. Cigarettes and Tide Bottles Before prisons outlawed smoking, cigarettes were common forms of money. Prisons were highly regulated, closed systems, but cigarettes were the perfect commodity money. They last for a long time. You can store a whole bunch without needing too much space. You can carry a bunch around with you and not really let anybody know how much money you have. All are perfect qualities of commodity money, small, portable, and durable. Turns out that humans have a deep instinct for figuring out exactly what can be accepted as commodity money. Once an economist carefully watched as his kids came home after trick-or-treating, they dumped out all their candy and started to trade. Without being told, without any instructions from the grown-ups, the kids started using Tootsie Rolls as commodity money, meaning they would accept Tootsie Rolls in exchange, and then they would use Tootsie Rolls to purchase other candy. Nobody really wanted Tootsie Rolls, but they all had enough of them that it made perfect sense. In some lower-income communities, black markets have evolved to use various things as commodity money. Tide bottles, cases of soda. In one study, they found the food stamp recipients would buy cases of soda and then trade the cases of soda for the black market items that couldn't be purchased with food stamps. Humans have historically been very creative with what serves as commodity money. But in our previous seashell horror story, the commodity money isn't always guaranteed to work. The very first minted coins served as standardized pieces of money. This generally led to an increase in economic activity. We can imagine a whole bunch of disconnected villages all using slightly different versions of commodity money. But as soon as a central ruler established a standardized coin, This allowed people to buy and sell from people they didn't need to be familiar with. So long as the coin was made from silver, and it bore the imprint of the official leadership of the larger society, everybody would accept it. Historically, even smaller societies outside of a larger kingdom have been known to copy the issued currency of the kingdom as it led to greater economic activity. Silver has generally been a preferred metal to use for coins because it is valuable on its own, It's very hard to get, which means that nobody can just whip up a batch of coins on their own. And they last a long, long time. Once they combined a silver coin with a picture of a local king or ruler, they were accepted everywhere. They could be stored for a long time. Paper money. How did paper become money? There are many different ways. One way is what Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, described as real bills. These were useful in small communities where everybody knows everybody else. Suppose you were a corn farmer and you needed somebody to come and fix your roof. So he would come and fix your roof, and you would give him an IOU for a certain amount of corn, or a certain amount of money once you were able to sell your corn. So long as you were a respected and trusted member of that society, the roof fixer could spend your IOU as money somewhere else. This means you would be able to essentially create your own money as an IOU. However, if you started to not pay your IOU when they were due, nobody would take your IOUs as payment anymore. This type of IOU money tended to keep tight communities honest with one another. 
Another way paper money popped up was if you had a bunch of coins and you deposited them in a bank. Then the banker would give you slips of paper that could be exchanged for your coins. So long as anybody could exchange those papers for the coins, those pieces of paper could also be spent as money. Generally speaking, any kind of paper money is only valuable if it comes from a trusted source or it can be used to get silver coins or other things that are valuable on their own. Paper Experiments Every so often, rulers have tried to issue paper and only paper to convince people to use it for money. Generally, this hasn't ended well. There have been times in history where paper money was used and accepted, but these were generally short-lived. Bottom Line This can end up happening in many different ways, but the most important reason for any commodity money to exist is that people must be willing to accept it in exchange for real things. When you give anybody any kind of money, be it cigarettes, gold coins, or Tootsie Rolls, the only reason they will accept it is if they believe they can keep it and then later use it to buy something they want. As we've seen through these brief examples, anything can be used, even a trusted community member's IOU, so long as the receiver believes they can use it to buy something of value in the future. Currently, the entire planet uses a paper money system. This has never happened before and the system in use today has only been around for a few decades. We'll treat modern money in our next podcast. I'm George Hutton. Thank you for listening to the Mind Persuasion Podcast. For more information, please visit mindpersuasion.com forward slash money dash brain. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. 